Welcome everyone and thank you for joining our webinar today. My name is Suzanne Walker and I'm the Senior Marketing Manager for Health Administration here at Jones and Bartlett Learning. Today I'm here with Sharon Bookbinder, Nancy Shanks, and Bobby Kite, authors of Introduction to Healthcare Management, which is due out in a new edition in two weeks. Collectively, they are going to discuss some of the latest issues in healthcare and then show us how they, they use case studies to bring these issues to life for their students. Before we get started, let me just run through a few house, housekeeping notes. First off, today's webinar is being recorded. After the session concludes, in the next day or so, you'll get a follow-up email with a link to the full recording that you can watch, watch and listen to at your leisure or share with others. Secondly, due to the scope of content and the overwhelming response to this webinar, we have muted your lines. Therefore, we won't be taking questions during the presentation, but encourage you to type your question at any time during the presentation into the question and answer box on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of the presentation, I'll read all the questions aloud and the presenters will respond accordingly. Um, so let me introduce you to our three presenters today. First, we have Sharon Bookbinder, who is currently professor and program coordinator of the MS in Healthcare Management program at Stevenson University in Maryland. And we have Nancy Shanks, who is a professor emeritus at the Department of Health Professions Healthcare Management Program at Metropolitan State University of Denver. And finally, we have Bobby Kite, who is currently, actually just was promoted to assistant dean uh, of the healthcare management program. And, and she's an associate, or was an associate professor at the University of Denver. So next, I'd like to turn things over to Bobby to get us started. Great, thank you. Um, so we're gonna talk about emergency and disaster management. So emergencies you can think of as man-made um, issues and disasters you can think of as nature-made issues. Um, these, we have a wide range of these, ranging from hurricanes, earthquakes, um, and the one we're gonna talk about specifically today is heat waves and heat-related incidents. Um, you know, the point here is that our population is growing, that as these emergencies and disasters increase, that you as a healthcare manager will deal with these at some point in your career, so it's best to be prepared. Um, again, we're gonna focus in on heat disasters. And the reason why is because heat kills more than all other natural disasters combined, and it's more costly. You know, uh, people are usually shocked to hear that, but if you think about the fact that in most natural disasters, when the power goes out, heat becomes a secondary disaster, it makes a little more sense. Secondly, as we think about heat disasters and we think about the definition of them, I wanna point out how ambiguous this definition is. If you read there on the slide, it basically says when it's hotter than normal for three days or more, it becomes very difficult to decide what death or um, injury is attributed to heat versus some other issue. Um, so as a healthcare manager, think about this from a political perspective. If something happens and it's uh, heat related uh, and, it, and it is political, then you as a healthcare manager might be the one who um, is asked to account for what happened a little more specifically than normal. So just to kind of throw some numbers out there, if we look at what's keeping this ambiguous definition of healthcare disasters or healthcare deaths in mind. In 2018 alone in the United States, we had 108 deaths from heat related uh, heat waves. And then look at the numbers for the others. Just to put this in perspective a little further, Chicago 1995 had a three day heat wave killed 800 people. And some might remember in 2003, Europe experienced a heat wave which killed 70,000, 15,000 in France alone. So with that ambiguous definition in mind, you can see even with these deflated numbers, how um, incredibly impactful heat related disasters are. So thinking about this as the healthcare manager, um, what, what kind of things do we need to keep in mind? One is that you can, th you can remember that all medical conditions are worsened by heat. Nothing is made better by being heat, except maybe if you're hypothermic, but that's rare, right? Um, and most of the heat disaster plans looking for a way to deal with this are asking you to move people to an air conditioning space. I'd like to remind you earlier when I was talking about heat as a secondary disaster, if you have no power, that's not gonna be possible. This coupled with the mass move from rural to urban areas with the urban heat idle effect really makes for a perfect storm of heat wave disaster. So again, thinking about the strongest defense being against heat related deaths as being that, elect that electricity, what kind of realistic options do you as a healthcare manager have to kind of deal with this um, 
serious serious challenge. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, what the symptoms and treatment of heat-related incidents are. You start out with heat cramps. Most of, us, most of us have experienced heat cramps at one time or another in our life. Then you have heat exhaustion and heat stroke. What's important about this slide is to remember that what is a heat cramp when you're 20 years old is a heat stroke when you're 60. And most of us over our lives don't experience that many heat events. And so when we experience that one when we're older, we tend to think it's going to be the same as it was when we were younger, not realizing that the advancement in age um, is going to make such a dramatic effect in its impact of us. So our vulnerable populations, right? So we can, of course, imagine that infants and children's are, children are more vulnerable than others, but there's also the elderly and the disabled, right? So think about assisted living, independent living facilities, which are multi-floors. The electricity goes out, you have no elevator. Compound that with um, isolation issues, um, the cognitive decline, the increase in cognitive uh, decline, it, these these make for a very vulnerable populations, right? So again, as a healthcare manager, keeping these in mind when you make these, uh, make plans to deal with it. So let's talk a little bit about planning for these disasters. You have population level strategies and you have organizational level. So at the population level, what's important to think about is um, the ripple effects of whatever your plan is. So I'll take Hurricane Rita and Houston as an example. In 2005, they decided to evacuate the city because they had several hurricanes before that that were disastrous. And when they did that, um, 127 people died on the freeways, most of those in those vulnerable populations we just mentioned. So it's important to know as a healthcare manager in a facility what type of population health strategies are being put out there so that you're able to help uh, mitigate the damage or help in those efforts to minimize uh, heat-related injuries. The other is using data to recognize these patterns, right? So when you're thinking about what you can do, make sure that your approach is realistic, right? So use the data that you have. I'll use an example. Um, if you have a healthcare facility where you have a rehab and it's several floors high and you don't have electricity, rather than trying to figure out routing electricity, maybe it's best just to move folks out of there. Use the, um, there's community emergency response teams you have in the area, which are volunteer organizations run through FEMA, which can, which can help you. So know what population health approach is realistic. Lastly, people are only going to remember what last time, what happened the last time they experienced that disaster. So if the last one wasn't bad, they're going to tend to think that this one is bad. Nobody wants to deal with mortality. So keep that in mind as you are putting your plans together. So the levels that you have, you have the consumer level. While you have the consumer, educate them. So while your patient is there or your consumer is there, if you have a moment to at least give them that bit of knowledge about how a heat cramp to a 20 year old is a heat stroke to a 60 year old, take the time to do that. The organization itself, make sure that you have a plan in place. I would challenge you after this call, go back and ask your organization, do we have a heat uh, a heat disaster response plan, read it. If it depends mostly on electricity, then I would strongly advise that you look at it again and see if there are other things you can do with it. And then know where your larger population level strategies lie. Um, specifically, the lines between city and county resources are interesting. So go back and make sure, especially if your organization's sitting in a spot between those city and county lines or there's any ambiguity there that you research that ahead of time so you know what resources will be available to you. And then lastly, we'll talk about the phases of disaster planning. Mitigate, right? So minimizing the opportunity for these to happen, uh, keeping an eye on what's going out, again, being prepared, knowing what your city, county, community resources are and coordinating with them. And then the response, right? So when you're actually responding, be clear that it's not going to go as planned. Um, and, and again, communication is key, right? Pulling in your partners. And then the last thing I would challenge you to think about is the recovery from these disasters. Um, usually the recovery from a heat related disaster is the beginning. If you're talking about a secondary uh, disaster heat related, then that's after a hurricane, which means the heat disaster is gonna last even longer. So just be mindful of, for instance, in Chicago, when those 800 folks died in three days, that was the beginning. There's diseases and all sorts of other things that come after an event like that. So, so make sure that you spend some time planning for that. And to recap, um, you know, we covered 
what are the definitions of these things? We covered a couple of different statistics. I encourage you to go check them because people are always convinced they're not right and, and myself included um, to prepare for these. And remember that as we have these climate changes that we are going to have, um, this is a long-term game. So one time preparing is not gonna be enough. This is something that you'll have to revisit probably multiple times in your career as a healthcare manager. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Sharon to present the next part. Thanks very much. That was really fun to hear you speak that. I've been working on these slides with Bobby and Nancy for quite some time now, and I always enjoy when I hear my co-editors' voices. I'm really glad you all are here with us today. Uh, this topic that we're going to be talking about next is uh, not one that's easy, and it's not something that you can easily get your arms around. Mental illness, substance use, abuse disorders, and federal legislation all go hand in hand. Uh, we have a, a, a challenging, to put it mildly, uh, history uh, along these lines, and it all began with our founding fathers and mothers. Uh, the puritanical religious framework considered deviance from normal behaviors a moral choice and the devil's work. You need only see uh, Salem, Massachusetts as a good example of where this was uh, most uh, evident and well documented because we were under English law at that time. You will see also as we move forward in history that the dichotomy between religious beliefs and evidence-based science and medical care continues to pervade U.S. healthcare politics and policies today, especially including substances, uh, mental health and substance abuse issues. Give you a little bit of perspective, we did have mental health services back in the 1700s. Uh, Benjamin Franklin and Dr. Thomas Bond established the first hospital in the United States to treat the poor and the mentally ill specifically. And this is a history of the University of Pennsylvania Hospital or HUP. In 1852, Congress appropriated $100,000 for an asylum for the, quote, insane of the District of Columbia, the Army, and the Navy. If you don't recognize a hospital from that brief description, I will tell you it is St. Elizabeth's Hospital. And it was at one time one of the largest mental hospitals in the country, uh, and you'll see more about that briefly. Pre-1950, psychiatrists employed various therapies with the seriously mental ill in restrictive settings. The approaches included talk therapy, straitjackets, art therapy, psychodrama, OT, hydrotherapy, and insulin electric shock therapy. Um, this, you know, I'm sure you've heard about that electroshock therapy is still used in some very rare uh, depression situations. For those non-responsive to previous approaches, frontal or prefrontal lobotomy, also known as leucotomy, is very invasive and life-altering brain surgery that severed the white matter connecting the two lobes was hailed as miracle cure. Uh, if you've read The Lobotomist, Bell I How High, uh, he describes how desperate people were uh, and when they had serious mental illness and how this became uh, the 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 golden key, if you will, uh, to mental health. Needless to say, there were a few problems with that. The first drug to treat mental illness did not appear until the 50s. And when Thorazine came in, then we were now being ushered into the psychopharmaceutical era. That was the breakthrough drug. However, uh, we also had shortly after that fears about institutionalization. If you've ever seen One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, uh, that movie, embodied all the fears that everyone had about being institutionalized. Uh, this combined with advances in drug therapy, the civil rights movement and state budget cuts to psychiatric hospitals led to what some people call a psychiatric titanic, i.e. the deinstitutionalization of the seriously mentally ill. Per E. Fuller Torrey, he was a psychiatrist at St. Elizabeth's in 1955, there were over slightly over half a million severely mentally ill patients in the nation's public psychiatric hospitals. By 1994, this number had been reduced to 71,619. So where did they go? They were sent to the least restrictive settings and they were supposed to be supported by a safety net of community mental health centers. Instead, little to no planning for medications and rehabilitation took place in the communities from where they, into where they were discharged. Uh, when I was working for the state of New York, uh, we were still looking at uh, the standing uh, 
single room occupancies where a lot of the people who'd been discharged from psychiatric hospitals were living. And so there were a fair number of people who were doing that. Um, where are they now? Uh, time has passed and over three quarters of our homeless veterans have serious mental illness and many of them also have substance use disorders. Uh, treatment of these co-occurring or comorbid conditions and dual diagnoses can be very challenging. Uh, substance use facilities do not always treat psychiatric diseases and psychiatric facilities don't always treat substance use disorders. So trying to find a facility that will help with a loved one who has comorbid conditions can be incredibly challenging. So similar to the chicken and the egg, substance use can call mental, cause mental illness and mental illness can cause substance use. Uh, complicating this matter is the fact that recent research indicates that substance use disorder is a form of self-medication for mental illnesses such as anxiety, depression, and bipolar disorders. And from this figure, you can see where this overlap is between mental illness and substance use disorder. So we have about 7.9 million people who suffer from both diseases. Here's a little bit of historical tidbit for you. Uh, before 1924, opium, laudanum, morphine, cocaine, and paragoric, which is a tincture of opium, were commonly part of a well-stocked household medicine chest. And housewives and physicians used it to treat coughing, diarrhea, stomach upsets, toothaches, restlessness, and severe pain, such as, you know, from burns or cancer in adults. They even used it for ch children who didn't sleep well, sometimes with deadly consequences. Heroin, a morphine derivative, was hailed as a wonder drug that could treat many, many ailments. However, the absence of 19th century physician knowledge of the negative potential of opiates led consumers to believe the use of opium and its cousins was safe. On the contrary, as we all know now, many users required higher doses to achieve the same effect, i.e. tolerance. And that tolerance led to physical dependence and psychological and physical signs of withdrawal and addiction. Uh, even when it's no longer necessary, the compulsive urge will be there for a true addict. So in 1924, three years before the Great Depression, uh, we had an epidemic of, of addicts. Southern whites had the highest addiction rate of any regional racial group in the country, perhaps one of the highest in the world, with Shreveport, Louisiana leading the nation with nine and a half addicts per thousand persons, nearly 9.7 times as great as the overall national average. Multiple federal laws were designed to regulate and tax the import, distribution, and use of opium and its related products, and they have lurched from decade to decade fighting popular opinions and forcing opioid addiction into the shadowy underworld of illegal acquisition and sales. Before 1924, there were clinics that were available for addicts to go to, to be treated, to get their doses of their opiate uh, products. And in 1924, with the, the really the first war on drugs with the Harrison Act, those clinics were shut down. However, these tactics, as you know, have failed to control the flow of opiates in the U.S. as well as behaviors of both prescribers and patients. So around the same time the Harrison Act was becoming law, Americans fell under the spell of Reformation and, and the Women's Christian Temperance Unit. And you probably recollect that this is Carrie Nation's group. Uh, it was a movement that was linked to evangelical Protestants and the Ku Klux Klan, little known fact. Carrie Nation did not live to see the enactment of the 18th Amendment in 1919, uh, but uh, she it was enacted, so a victory, if you will. Uh, but a little over a decade later, in 1933, a nation that claimed it would never have spirits touching its lips again repealed the 18th Amendment and bars opened rip for business again. In the intervening 14 years between the enactment of Amendment 18 and its repeal with the 21st Amendment, Chicago's Al Capone became rich. He had speakeasies, he had drug running businesses, and it was all enabled by prohibition. Uh, he became famous along with Elliot Ness, and there were many great superheroes built out of it, including our iconic Dick Tracy. But it was a very bloody and very uh, horrible time in those 14 years. We, you will see in the textbook when you get it that Table 17 provides an overview of the history of these laws and the rationale for the laws and the effect of the laws. 
and unintended consequence consequences probably could be the best name for this table because you look at the law and what it's supposed to do and then you go well that didn't work out so well then they had another law and what they're supposed to do and they go oh that didn't work out so well so this keeps going on and this is why we're uh, having you know lurching and lurching and lurching from decade to decade so it helps for us to be able to give our students uh, the opportunity to see where we came from when they're looking at today's headlines. Here is a big issue now, uh, OxyContin's in all the news, so I wanna give you and your students a little history. Uh, in 1986, the World Health Organization addressed the need for pain relief for cancer patients. Uh, 1995, the American Pain Society launched its pain as the fifth vital sign campaign. You might remember this. And in the same year, the Veterans Administration adopted pain as the fifth vital sign campaign. Enter the heroes, Purdue Pharma with OxyContin. Purdue hired hundreds of drug detail salesmen and deployed them like an army uh, to prescribers offices to hard sell OxyContin. Uh, videos and sales materials provided to physicians claim that less than 1% of patients would become addicted to opioids and that the pain, not the opioids, was what was blurring the patient's minds. Purdue Pharma, owned by the Sackler family, lied about the risk of OxyContin. This is in all the news now. Uh, Richard Sackler, uh, president and CEO, instructed drug detailers to tell physicians it was the patient's fault, not the drug if they became addicted. And this really just sort of fell into that moral framework as opposed to the evidence-based scientific medical uh, framework that it was really the addicts who were immoral, not that it was the drug salespeople who were the immoral people. And it just harkens back to 1924 when addicts had not been criminalized, but after the uh, 1924 and the Harrison Act, they became criminalized and sent to the shadows. This is a continuation of that moral uh, framework. Concomitant with the aggressive sales pitches, Purdue contributed millions of dollars, surprise, to the pain as the fifth vital sign campaign. So uh, at the same time, they were supplying cure for pain, they were drumming up the business of, of pain, uh, the demand. The federal government even got in the game. Uh, they relented under pressure and they lifted prescribing restrictions at the same time. The DEA approved increasing opiate production by 200%, so their part of these two. Millions of patients became addicted to OxyContin. The drug soon became a street drug, thanks to unscrupulous prescribers and drug distributors, all regulated by the DEA. Manufacturers, distributors, drug stores, pharmacists, and physicians all contributed to West Virginia's dubious distinction of having the highest drug overdose rate in the nation. In April 2019, Lawrence Dowd, the CEO of Rochester Drug Cooperative, was indicted for narcotics conspiracy and conspiracy to defraud the DEA. And this is where we finally began to see these uh, executives as who they really were, drug dealers in three-piece suits. Uh, Dowd instructed employees to disregard internal compliance policies regarding the control and distribution of the drug and knew the drug knew the drug was being diverted to illegal distribution channels, i.e. the streets, all to increase his executive compensation. It was killing people and getting richer and he didn't care. Uh, in Mar May 2019, a jury found five executives of Insys Therapeutics guilty of federal racketeering. Uh, they were charged with bribing doctors to prescribe subsys, a nasal spray version of the highly addictive synthetic opioid fentanyl, to people who didn't need it. They also con were convicted of defrauding Medicare and private insurance. Now there are over, I think is over 2,000 lawsuits, including cities, counties, tribes, and states against Purdue Pharma. And recently Purdue Pharma talked about going into chapter 11 so that they could avoid all this. And there are many uh, district attorneys who want to go after the family. In 2007, the company pleaded guilty to understanding the risk of addiction, including failing to alert doctors that it was a stronger painkiller than morphine, and agreed to pay $600 million in fines and penalties. Now, just want to take a moment to pause and show you this figure. Our whole focus for the last year and a half, maybe two years, has been on deaths due to opioids. 
but when you compare our annual deaths due to the tobacco, alkaloid, alcohol, and opioids, there's a dramatic difference. And it's not to say those deaths from opioids don't matter, because they matter very much. Every one of us, I'm sure, has been touched by a death from an opioid overdose in their family, their community, their workplace. But when you look at the fact that tobacco killed nearly half a million people and that alcohol killed nearly 100,000 people, you have to wonder what is failing in our healthcare policy and our policies in general. So there we are. Tobacco legally kills almost half a million people a year. Alcohol kills nearly 88,000. The first two carry no stigma, but opioids killing 70,000 people in 2017, that is stigma. Then we have to ask our students and ourselves this question. If tobacco is a product that when used as direct, it will kill you, why is it still legal? And that's a question that I pose to my students. Why is this still legal? And it goes to politics and policy. I'm going to now bring in another fun topic uh, to discuss with students. Uh, always challenging, always exciting when you bring this topic up. Uh, vaccine preventable diseases, re-emerging outbreaks, and deaths. So just a little quick review of vaccines and what they do. Uh, they work by imitating an infection, and they stimulate the body's immune system to respond as if it were a real infection. Uh, Wakefield's fraudulent article linking autism to vaccinations was retracted. However, the perception that vaccines are bad remains in the minds of some parents and healthcare consumers. So one of the things that I emphasize to my students repeatedly is that work was fraudulent. He made up all the numbers and the article that was published in Lancet was retracted and he lost his license as a physician in England. anti on the other hand, sort of, they just sort of like to ignore that part of the data. Uh, Anti-vaxxers are the people of anti-vaccination, don't believe in vaccinations, and often actively oppose them using fake science and misinformation, which is spread primarily on the internet. Uh, those sites play on values associated with individuality, freedom of choice, and religious beliefs. And some of the material that they have in there is uh, in, incorrect and actually flat out lies about how vaccines are manufactured. There was one website and brochure that was being circulated that was that included monkey brains and ground up fetuses and that they were, they were distributing this to people who were uh, interested, shall we say, and vulnerable. Uh, they use persuasive communication techniques and misinformation to increase distrust of big pharma and the government. And they repeat and amplify falsified research findings of autism and brain damage, despite the fact that that was uh, retracted and he was found to be fraudulent. Anti-vaxxers uh, contribute to worldwide outbreaks and deaths. Uh, some facts about measles. There are some people who sort of become nostalgic. Oh, I remember having measles when I was a child. I was in bed for a week. It was lovely. I got to read books. That's really not the case. People died before the vaccine, measles vaccine. Uh, about three to four million people got measles each year. Of those people, 400 to 500 died. Um, almost 50,000 were hospitalized and 4,000 developed encephalitis and had major neurological sequelae from measles. Uh, right now, worldwide, measles cases are up 300%. Although some protests that measles has very few adverse effects, the World Health Organization reported 110 deaths globally, mostly among children under the age of five. And to give you a sense of how bad it can be when a child with measles goes into a hospital, uh, one kid in a pediatric oncology clinic infected 23 other children, more than 50% who wound up with severe complications and the case fatality rate was 21%. So there's you are, in an oncology clinic with your child, helping them to get you know, treatment for cancer, and then someone with measles walks in and your child is at risk of dying. Then there's the cost of responding to one measles case. It can be as high as $142,000. In 2011, the estimated total cost of measles outbreaks in the US ranged from 2.7 million to 5.3 million. The WHO has named vaccine hesitancy as number eight on the top 10 list of threats to global health in 2019. 
In 2015, California passed vaccination legis legislation requiring all children to be vaccinated against diseases, including measles and pertussis. The state repealed all non-medical exemptions within a year, including religious and philosophical exemptions. Vaccination rates were tracked by Dora and colleagues, and there was a 3% increase in measles, mumps, and rubella vaccinations, and a 2% increase in other required vaccinations. So policy matters. Uh, policy matters and good information matters. Uh, just in case we like to think that, you know, we're adults and our students are adults, uh, this happened uh, very close to home in 2019. Quarantines were imposed at the University of California and California State University, both in LA, for over 200 students, faculty, and staff exposed to a confirmed case of measles and who cannot prove, prove they have vaccinations against measles. So, you know, I don't know about you, but I have be very hard pressed to find my measles vaccination documentation. And there you have it. Tag, you have measles. And that's where we're at right now in this country uh, if we don't have a more aggressive posture when it comes to vaccination. Some facts about vaccine preventable diseases and some talking points for students and other people that you may have conversations with. Uh, unlike what a politician said, uh, he claimed that he wasn't worried about measles because we have antibiotics. Well, the, the truth is antibiotics don't cure viruses. Uh, measles is a highly contagious virus. It is transmitted by aerosolization. Um, if someone coughs and has measles and coughs in a room, those droplets hang in the air for up to two hours and can infect that next person who comes into the room two hours later. Pertussis, also highly contagious respiratory disease, has that characteristic cough. If you haven't heard a whooping cough, I su suggest you go to CDC's website and look for the whooping cough sound. It's, it's, uh, it will give you shudders when you hear it. It sounds like the child is dying. Like measles, it can be transmitted via aerosolization. And let's not forget about our friend polio. Um, we don't have polio in this country thanks to vaccines. It is very contagious. It is spread through contact with a stool of an infected person and droplets from a sneeze or cough. And here's fun fact, it's transmissible directly on inanimate objects. So a toy, a chair, anything that you know someone who has polio touches then pass that virus on. Ebola, on the other hand, is only transmitted through direct contact with body fluids that contain the virus. And healthcare workers who take care of the sickest, dying, and dead Ebola victims when they're part of a burial party are at greater risk than the general population. So when you think about the panic that we had about Ebola, but somehow we don't have a panic about measles, you know, there's a there's a dichotomy there as to what what are we thinking. So back to immunization, uh, it's stimulating the body with vaccines to create antibiotic antibodies against a disease, and it currently prevents an estimated two to three million deaths every year. Measles, polio, pertussis, and influenza by themselves kill more people annually than Ebola has at the height of the latest outbreak. That's pretty amazing. Some data to share with you here, as you can see, in these, this table, measles in the last year, there were 555 cases, uh, but it's up because this is even, uh, this is from April, I believe, and that number I believe is closer to 1,000. Uh, globally, in the last time that we had the data, 110,000 deaths due to measles in 2017. Pertussis is, uh, in the United States, 10,000 to 40,000 cases each year, and up to 20, 20 children's deaths. These are the vulnerable population. Anybody under the age of five is the most vulnerable to any of these uh, vaccination preventable diseases. Uh, again, no polio in this country, thank God, uh, but polio is worldwide and we had 33 cases uh, globally and it can lead to irreversible paralysis. And of those who get polio, Five to 10% die when their breathing muscles become immobilized. I'm old enough to remember iron lungs and the quarantine signs on doors when people had polio. And I remember getting my sugar cube. So this isn't that distant to pass. Uh, flu, 
Uh, we had 41 million cases and 91 pediatric deaths in the U.S. last year. And globally, we had between three and five million cases of severe illness and 290,000 to 650,000 respiratory deaths all ages. Ebola, we had no cases in 2018, and there's one country that has Ebola right now. It's the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and there's a lot of problems associated with that, including some violence against healthcare workers and vaccinators. When we prepare for outbreaks, one of the things we have to be mindful of is not blaming the person who is taking care of the patient. Uh, we had a former, and I mean former, CDC director who blamed a nurse for getting Ebola, claiming that she hadn't used proper uh, prevention measures. He was not being just, he was being punitive and he lost his job. Uh, he uh, was not partaking in the just culture, which distinguishes between human error, which is an inadvertent action or a slip or a lapse or mistake. In the case of the nurse who got Ebola, they didn't have proper precautions because they hadn't been trained. No one knew how to manage it. At-risk behavior is a choice that increases risk where risk is not recognized or it's mistakenly believed to be justified. And reckless behavior is a behavioral choice to consciously disregard a substantial and unjustifiable risk. I think there are very few people who go to work in a hospital or healthcare setting and say, I'm going to be reckless today. And I think there are a few people who say, I'm going to be at risk. Maybe, you know, I'm, I'm running tight on time. Maybe I just need to, you know, not change this IV today. Maybe it'll be okay. I don't, that would be more common. The human error is the most common in terms of what thing, what happens. And this is where we have good quality improvement. You can follow this and you can take care of this and you do some root cause analysis. But preparation for outbreaks requires us to have a just culture so that we can distinguish between these behaviors. Nancy, are you on? I am. Can you hear Yay. me? I hear you now. Hold on. Let me pass the baton to you. Thank you. Thank you. Sharon and Bobby and I have always used lots of cases and news items as uh, useful and timely topics in our teaching. And as you can see um, from the slides, there are a, a ton of news um, items or other things that can make for good cases that you can use in the classroom. And um, some of the topics, if you, you know, I assume that most of us still read newspapers or watch um, the news feeds on our cell phones or watch TV, you know that there are just umpteen healthcare topics that are available to um, all of us as teaching items. For example, just last week, there was a whole uh, bunch of information about this genetic testing scam that was set up to get Medicare patients to take these genetic tests. And the purpose was to steal patients' identities and um, to generate fraudulent bills uh, to Medicare. And luckily, the... Um, the uh, HHS jumped on top of this and has been warning people and it's been all over the news. But those kinds of things are great examples um, that can be used as cases. There's also been recent information about um, claims denials that have left consumers with huge medical bills from major healthcare hospital systems, out of network providers and others. In particular, University of Virginia is, you know, being scrutinized and has gotten a bunch of horrible PR from uh, sending all these, uh, a number of their patients uh, into bankruptcy, foreclosing on their homes, all that sort of stuff. Not what you want to have happen uh, as a healthcare manager. 
Um, there are issues, as we know, about vaping as a public health emergency, um, and that is very recent. Sharon's talked about the Sackler family and Purdue, and you know that can be made into a case discussing lawsuits or issues about ethics and marketing and uh, those sorts of things. So the bottom line is there are just lots and lots of um, cases out there that can really make for great uh, ways to help students understand the topics that have been discussed today as well as the other topics that are in um, the textbook. So um, when you receive the new edition of Intro to Healthcare Management, you'll find over 40 new cases um, to ad address these types of topics. And we hope that you'll find those useful to yourselves and to your students and find them as um, very informative teaching opportunities um, as you move forward in um, using the textbook. So thanks for coming today. Sharon, would you pass it back to Suzanne? Thank you very much, all of you. Um, in addition to the new and significantly revised cases and coverage of emerging of emerging issues you heard about today, the authors have made significant updates for their fourth edition, which is due out October 14th. They've added new emphases on population health and information management to their broad coverage of important issues in healthcare management, such as ethics, cost management, strategic planning and marketing, information technology, human resources, and more. Um, I want to open this up now to questions, and as a reminder, if you have a question or a comment, please type it in the question box located at the lower right hand of your screen. Also, you'll notice on your screen uh, the complete slide deck that we use today is posted and can be easily downloaded. So any, please, please uh, give us your questions now, and we will ha happily have the authors chime in with their thoughts and answers. We have one question here. Uh, I'm interested in, other than lecturing, what kinds of engaging learning activities have you used in your classroom using cases? Um, so could any of the authors respond to that? All of the cases have a series of questions. Um, the ones in the textbook, obviously, have a series of questions that can be used for course discussion. And for all of the instructors in the online materials, there is a case guide. So if, a, if you want to use a particular case that isn't your primary area of expertise, like a, a finance case or something like that, you can go to the instructor's guide to help you prepare for the discussion and how to answer the questions. I mean, it doesn't provide specific answers, but it helps you guide the discussion in the classroom. Does that help? I think so. I think that's very valuable. I'll just uh, piggyback on, on Nancy's comments. Uh, there right. are also in this edition, there are, I think, five or six different sets of exercises that address different topics. So in addition to the cases, we also have exercises where the students actually have to go out and find the data at a given uh, data set, whether it's state, local, or federal level, and respond to the questions about different aspects of public health issues. So we have the exercises that we've incorporated this edition as well. Great. Um, we have another comment here, very good presentation, great background information to provide and then follow up with cases. Appreciate your presentation greatly. What would be the best strategy to use with people who question the safety and efficacy of vaccines, including policymakers? People tend to believe them more than science in the current administration. Yeah, it, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on this, and Sharon. Um, 
it is extremely challenging. And one of the things that uh, the physician literature, GMA, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, is saying not to be confrontational with inv individuals who have their minds made up. Uh, what they suggest is laying out all the facts and then very gently addressing each of their, their uh, obstacles. Oh, I hear that these are made up from ground up fetuses and monkey brains. Uh, well, actually, here's the content of the thing. What is it that you're hoping to accomplish? Well, I don't want my child to get, you know, be sick because if they get the measles vaccine, they'll be sick. So then you can give them the data that says, well, you have to really just keep coming back with here are the facts, here's the, here's the and they can say, you know, that, you know, they, they don't believe you or whatever. And it's some people you simply cannot have a, a conversation with them about it, but all you can do uh, is to lay out the facts and say, these are the facts and this is what the CDC says and this is what the World Health Organization says. And they're not owned by pharma by the way. So that is uh, something to, to consider as well that, you know, you pointed out there that the data comes from organizations that are not run by pharma, despite what some people might say. It's a challenge. It's a real challenge. Thank you, Sharon. That was really helpful. Um, we have, uh, somebody wants to you to repeat where the exercises can be found in the new edition. They will be in chapter 18. Uh, which is the case study chapter. And so uh, it will be just, it'll be listed in there as part, as an exercise. And um, so it'll be easy to find the uh, exercise. And Nancy, it's in the index too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And, in the and in the table of contents, if you look at the table of contents, you'll say, see exercises for public policies on, you know, violence, uh, exercise for public policy on ACA. Uh, so it's, it's interesting because a lot of the stuff that we've been working on for a long time has, is coming to fruition under the current administration. There is a, there's an exercise on planning for the closure of Planned Parenthood uh, uh, clinic in your, near your hospital, what's going to happen. And actually, um, we've been using that in my classrooms for a little bit now, and the students find out that there's a lot that they didn't know about Planned Parenthood. And that's another way to get people to see, no, they don't only do abortions, they do primary care, and not just for women, but also for men. So making the students go dig out the facts and get real sources, scholarly sources, is the way to teach them uh, what the reality is. Um, the other thing I would add is at the end of each of the chapters in the book, there are a list of the cases and I think the exercises that are related to that chapter. Yes, yes you're so, right, Nancy. Um, there are a number of places that you can find these things. Great. We have another question here. Do the cases bring in different perspectives of different providers, more interprofessional teaching options? I would say yes. Um, the um, one of the things that we've tried to do with the new edition is to include cases that don't focus on one type of provider. So some of them are related to um, public health issues. Others, as the one Sharon just mentioned, um, relate to community health centers, some to nursing homes. So our intent is, with the bo entire book, is to not have it focus on hospitals only. There are cases about physician practices. There are cases about all different substantive areas like uh, human resources management, financial management, policy, all those sorts of things. So um, you should, in the... Um, 40 plus cases that are in chapter 18, you should be able to find a variety of topics, um, a variety of providers. Any further questions? I think that's the last one I can see here. Well, I wanna thank all of our presenters today. Um, special thank you to Sharon, uh, Nancy, and Bobby for a very thoughtful and informative presentation. 
As I mentioned earlier, this entire session has been recorded and I will send around a follow-up email with all those details. If you have any questions about anything, please feel free to simply reply to that email. And with that, I'd like to thank you for coming today and conclude today's webinar.